a correction before we start the show. A few weeks after this episode aired, it came out that the publishers of this study misrepresented several pieces of data and greatly exaggerated others. After further review, a peer consensus was quickly reached that it is extremely unlikely that it is, in fact, lithium. When listening to this episode, please remember that everything we say has been discredited, and this is now a great time capsule of how easy it is for me to get lost in excitement. I fell for the old believing what people say trick. Welcome to the Bayesian Conspiracy. I'm Inyash Brodsky. I'm Steven Zuber. I'm Jay Sticky. And today, real quick, if you are hearing a different audio uh, thing, or if you hear us talking over each other a bit, that is because we are recording remote. Uh, but we are dedicated to bringing you episodes as often as possible. So we are uh, we're calling in today to not have to call in the episode. Yes. Cool. And it would be sad to miss a you know biweekly episode because it's like almost the only time i get to interact with you guys no plus like you know if we can't set aside two hours every two weeks to do this that's almost sounds like doing? not even trying yeah, but yeah <laughs> all right so anyway. normally we set aside four hours i think today it'll be just <laughs> that might be excessive though yeah today it'll probably be just three <laughs> it, it I, I hope it's we'll not even that long it's we're starting late so let's rock and roll all right. Uh, before we get into anything else, quick feedback from the Discord. Wes says uh, on our last episode when we were talking about the normal distribution, I absolutely hate when people are like, this doesn't involve any advanced math, and then start using <laughs> Greek letters. Just say mean, or even better, average. Using Greek letters is the opposite of accessible. Rule one when talking to a lay audience is do not use jargon. Don't define the jargon, then use it. Just don't use it. Taboo the jargon. So... Okay, point well taken. Maybe we should have done that. Yeah, I saw. Well, I mean, well, we we were reading the post that was given to us. Like, I and it, it was already dumbed down for like lay people uh, as much as it could have from been, but... from the point of view of a mathematician, right? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't Gotta feel like we could have condensed it down. In mind. If we were to condense it down anymore, we'd have just been like, "There's a cooler way to do probability estimates." That's it. That that's like that's all we could say if we were to dumb it down anymore, right? Like, yeah. So I, I think it was hard to do in audio and that's fine. Um, but I, I actually happened to catch some of that chat on discord. And I think uh, the rule of thumb is like never, Oh, this might've been Stephen Hawking was like, never use equations <laughs> if you're writing for, for a public audience, um, which like if you're writing a mathematical explanation or, or uh, training thing, good luck with that. So uh, I, I have to, I, I think he did the best he possibly could. You know, mm -hmm. like, I don't, I don't know what else there is to say. Like if, if you have to be a not five-year-old at math to get it, then that's just the, that's the audience. And mm -hmm. I'm about five and a half. And so I got part of it. Um, I think uh, Matt Freeman commented and was like, yeah, people want their, you know, small two-door sports car to seat six, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you want to have it both ways, but you just can't. So um yeah i anyway. honestly feel like equations are at least maybe this is just me but um i consider them to be visual the same way like if we were looking at a piece of art and then trying to describe it like it doesn't maybe necessarily make the best audio uh it feels almost like i mean like i think it's a cool challenge it was kind of interesting that way also i was like in a pretty depressed state last week and i re or last two weeks i listened to the last episode and i was like i barely said anything huh i was mostly just going uh-huh or like mm -hmm. making stupid jokes. So sorry about that. Uh, yeah, stupid jokes are always welcome. It was because I wasn't interested in the subject, but but he pointed out like if you wanted to hack your accuracy rating, you could just set your sigma to like a million, and then you'd always fall within two thirds. Of <laughs> and uh, I qu quickly wanted to um, respond to that. There is actually an equation further down in the post that tells you how good your sigma is as well, but it require it it involves, you know, square roots and even more math, and I didn't want to get into it. And also, like, this wasn't about how to cheat and hack the system to make yourself look crazy good. It was, like, how to use no, um, normal prediction for yourself. And for that, you just make your best guess a good faith effort and see if you got within two-thirds sigma. It's not like this isn't going to be an episode for 
how you hack the system. I'm an expert, yeah. Or... I don't think you would look good when you showed people your work, right? Mm-hmm. And you, they'd be like, like, oh, you, you made this. You know, it's like, oh, look at this. I beat this game in 20 minutes. It's like, yeah, but you put in the God mode cheat and you could fly. Right. Like, th- that's it not sounds impressive like doing anymore. beginner mode for yourself in order to kind of lower the barrier of entry. Yeah. Plus, then they could just run the equation and be like, look, your number is really bad. So you suck at choosing Sigma. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or choosing standard deviation, I guess, since we're not using Greek letters. All righty. Uh, let's move on to the Lestrong post, as always. Works for me. Cool. And uh, I was going to say really quick, Jace, uh, I, I didn't notice that you seemed off kilter last week. Uh, if, if from the inside it felt that way, um, I'm sorry you're having a rough episode or a rough no, recording during that episode. But uh, from the outside, you seemed as smart and as engaged as ever, which is probably really? disappointing to hear, actually. Right? Because <laughs> yeah, like, well, it kind of is. Well. Because when yeah. I listened to it again, I was like, I, I, I said almost nothing of value in this episode. I was just like, uh huh, or like, wow, or like, insert dumb joke. <laughs> Maybe I just had fun hanging out, and I don't remember what you well, said, because I definitely didn't yeah. listen to the episodes. So. I'm glad to hear that, because I always have you know so much social anxiety about how I come off. Oh, Especially, like, I have a lot of social anxiety about trying to do anything involving math, because I suck yeah. at math. Well, But we're going to talk about the halo effect here, right? We are. The first less wrong post is the halo effect. Segways are weird. I am going to be talking a fuck ton in the second half of this episode. Uh, do you guys okay. want to get these? And also, we should probably get through them faster if possible, yeah, yeah, since yeah. it's such a long main topic. Yeah, Eosh um, picked the topic for this one and is going to teach us whatever it was about. So I'm excited. I have stuff to say about it, too. So uh, how about Grand. I'll do the Halo effect, because that's something interesting to me. Steven, you wanted to go through superhero bias, and then uh, yeah. we'll figure out who's going to do Mere Messiahs. Because that was plan. pretty short, actually. Um, mm-hmm. All right. Like when I think of the halo effect, I actually think I, I tend to have a really positive association with it. The way that Eliezer is describing the halo effect is that you perceive a positive affect like it, you know, it incorporates things such as attractiveness. It was kind of linking back to our previous week when we were talking about like things such as when subjects in a study are told about the benefits of nuclear power, then they're likely to rate it as having fewer risks because if you present something as being like, it has all these goodness attributes, you're like, cool, this has goodness attributes, probably doesn't have any badness attributes. Mm -hmm. Eliezer talks about how this relates to subjective assessments of humans. And again, you have to kind of caveat that any kind of social science studies are probably subject to, you know, what was it called? The crisis of... Repl- replication crisis. Replication, the replication crisis. But uh, this seems like, even with the replication crisis, to be pretty solid that when people see a person who is attractive, and especially, unfortunately, um, attractive for their gender, you know, uh, Eliezer again talks about skeletal structure, which is very frustrating for me as a late transitioning trans guy, because your, your bones, the, the bone plates just stop being flexible does, after you're like 20 some does he he doesn't talk about it in this post right um no i think he does he mentioned skeletal structure but like anyway like hmm, okay. tallness is a thing that's affected by that uh yeah. and just yeah bone structure generally especially facial because we humans are obsessed with faces uh symmetry and skin clearness and there's all kinds of stuff but i could talk about this for a while but so he's saying that like basically the halo effect is in this case, you see something as having positiveness, or it's presented that way, and then you tend to sort of push down the idea that it has any risks. And so if you experience that, it should make you suspicious. There might be other kinds of halo effects for things like kindness or intelligence when it comes to humans. Uh, and then he ends with kind of like, let's say you know someone who's not only, who doesn't only seem very intelligent, but also honest, altruistic, kindly, and serene. You should be suspicious some of these perceived characteristics are influencing your perception of the others. Now, see, as someone who is very intelligent, honest, altruistic, kindly, and serene, I kind of take offense at this. <laughs> and you're also taller than the rest than the two of us, so. Yeah, hmm. yeah we could probably stand on each other's shoulders and, like, be an Annie Ash. <laughs> mm, no, no, I am not as tall as the two of you put together. I have no idea how tall anyone is. I have a height blindness, apparently. But anyway. Uh, you're definitely more than... Of- than a few inches tall. My conception of halo uh, effect was like conventional attractiveness, conventional unattractiveness. And maybe this is just my own weird brain or the fact that I'm an artist and I spent like a ton of time drawing people and faces. Uh, I was pretty obsessed with like traditional beauty for a while or conventional beauty. 
trying to get that symmetry, trying to figure out what it was. Once you crack the code, then it's boring. Hmm. Then you're drawing the same face over and over again with like slight differences. And that's kind of how I like perceived people where I used to be like really interested in pretty people. And now I'm kind of like, whatever. <laughs> uh, I like faces that have character. Like cool scars. Um, <laughs> Halo or effect. ethnicity. I- I, I didn't have to see <laughs> when I was skimming when I was reading it earlier, but I imagine that it's uh, at least it could be linked to in like the not all policy debates should be one sided sort of thing, right? Um, mm-hmm. You get halo effect around your political affiliations as well. Um, superhero bias can be summarized in the following movie clip, which is from Batman mm-hmm. versus Superman when Batman blocks a punch from Superman. You're not brave. The line is, you're not brave, men are brave, right? Yeah. yeah. All right, so in the clip, Which, Batman, Batman was talking. That does Superman. sum it up, damn. Point, that, that's the whole thing. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's it. So, and that's why Superman's a boring superhero in the contexts where, like, is he going to be okay? You know, he's fun in the sense of, like, will he have to kill people? Will he have to compromise his beliefs? It's metropolitan, Whatever. man. It's great. And if it's anything else, then don't hold your breath. <laughs> Yeah, you, you want a hero. Some writers do it good. Real heroes are vulnerable, Bat- or Superman isn't. So Batman's right. Superman's not brave because he's never in any danger. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he, this also ties into the Mere Messiah's post really well because... Uh, yeah, roll those two together. Yeah. Do it. G- Jesus is built up as like, you know, not only is he, you know, enlightened and, and uh, I don't know, zen and chill, but he's also the son of God and born of a virgin and the redeemer of all humankind and actually God himself, actually. And uh, it's kind of like with Superman. It's like, yeah, he's got super strength. Oh, and he can fly. Oh, and he can shoot laser beams from his eyes. Oh, and he's got ice breath. Like, mm-hmm. it, you just keep adding traits, right? Just let, like, let him be the thing. And actually, the less things he has, the cooler he is. Mm-hmm. Um, so Jesus is contrasted to, uh, um, I should get the guy's full name, Perry something, but my internet's being super slow right now. Um, that guy Perry. John Perry was a police officer uh, who responded to the uh, World Trade Center attacks uh, 2001 and was also a transhumanist and I believe Kronosis, um and was lost forever when the building collapsed on it. Um, so Yudkowsky makes the case that this guy is much more of a hero than, say, someone like Jesus and I'll say someone like Superman, right? Mm-hmm. He did believe he'd have an after. He probably didn't believe in an afterlife because he was a transhumanist. He probably, you know, wanted whatever. to live forever regardless. Yeah, which yeah. makes it even more tragic. But he, yeah. but he worked a job where you know uh, it had a higher mortality rate than the average job, and ran into a burning building and actually died for it. Um, so actually putting yourself on the line is way more heroic than like being merely a messiah, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. and this this post it almost feels like a um. What is he called? Not an obituary, but when someone's dead and you're remembering them uh, after their death. Yes, yes. Uh, Because it's just the way it's written. It ends on such a sad note, but also a note of honoring this person who's done a great thing. And I I suspect it was written mainly to to immortalize him in in some small way. I thought that was really nice. It has that effect because in the previous post, um, not superhero, or wait, yeah, superhero bias, he talks about Gandhi. Uh, Eliezer, and then, uh, you know, he's super famous, but was he the most altruistic person? Most people will kind of associate him with that, but what about, you know, the nameless woman who marched in the front lines and wasn't Gandhi and was crippled for the cause and nobody will ever remember her name? And that's, like, upsetting when you think about it. It's an interesting question, because that assumes... Like, who's more that... heroic, Gandhi or her? And who's more remembered? Well, right, th- that assumes that being remembered after your death is valuable in in some really deep intrinsic way that the fame is important and personally i agree just, yeah i, I was gonna say i want to just sort of be saying that john perry deserves to be remembered yeah i i want that for myself to to you know be remembered and famous live on after my death but gandhi you know was due to the fact that he was famous he was also a he had a big target painted on him by people who would want to stop him. And I, yeah. he was in fact assassinated in, in the end. So, and there were numerous attempts on his life. Putting yourself at the front of a movement. Like I feel like this, uh, the, the superhero bias article did kind of say, well, you know, Gandhi was safer than a bunch of his followers because he was famous. And as someone who really doesn't want to be famous and has hated any amount of spotlight that I've ever gotten, 
I think that actually there's also something to be said for standing up and being like the figurehead of a movement, which, which is kind of painting a target on yourself. Mm -hmm. It gives you all these benefits, but it has like, in my, you know, opinion, way more drawbacks than I would want. Yeah. If I wanted to kill the morale of Gandhi's movement, I'd kill Gandhi, not one of his, you know, followers. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I feel like you're, you do put a target on your back, lead a thing like that. Um, segue into for next time, effective death spirals, <laughs> Resist the Happy Death Spiral and <laughs> Uncritical Supercriticality. All just great titles. Yeah, and appropriate as well for the times. But we'll get to that next week because, or next episode, because this episode we are talking about, about. a chemical hunger. How did you come across this post? I'm so uh, chemicals right now. <laughs> Eliezer <laughs> posted something somewhere. I. Maybe Facebook, maybe Twitter. I don't remember where he said it, but he was like, you know, a lot of just strange people coming up with new weird ideas could use funding. And if I was to dump some funding into just something that looks really bizarre, but might um, have big impact if it turns out to be true, like this is one of the places I would dump some money. And I was like, well, that sounds interesting. Let's look into this. And then I started reading it, and then I could not stop reading it. And it's mm. very, very long, but I tried to condense it as much as I could. Cool. Yeah, we could, try to cover the, we could try to cover the main points. And also, the whole time I was reading it, I kept thinking, I really want uh, Stephen Goyene's A Hungry Brain, or at least Scott Alexander's review of it, to be like a prerequisite for this. I yeah, it it's, was. it's mentioned several times within A uh, Chemical yeah. Hunger as well. Yeah. But okay, A Chemical Hunger. Uh, this is a series of essays based, I think it's a book. I'm not sure if they're going to eventually print it and bind it into a book. But uh, right now, it is a long series of essays linked uh, chronologically, not chronologically, you know, the way you would chapters uh, online, we will include a link to it in the show notes. It is examining what is causing the modern obesity epidemic. And the answer they come to is uh, environmental contamination, probably by lithium, most likely. And that is what we're going to dive into. Which I find a wild... Oh, um, were you trying to say something, Stephen? I was just going to say real quick that... Because uh, I know I'll forget. Because um, it talks about obesity rates. And then uh, it mentioned in the post that Colorado is the leanest state. Mm -hmm. And you didn't put that in the short notes here. Uh, which is only worth keeping in mind because if you've ever been anywhere else, it, you, it might jump out at you be like, oh, there's like ratio of heavy people is is bigger here, right? Mm -hmm. um, I just think it's, I noticed that when I was like a teenager and first visited uh, a state that wasn't Wyoming. Um, mm -hmm. And then you get back to Colorado and you're like, oh, this is the thinnest state? All right, if you say so. Um, <laughs> all right, data. I have the perspective of uh, having moved here from the East Coast where it sort of reminds me of... Um, I have an aunt and uncle who, actually, my uncle was in the World Trade Center disaster, and they paid off his whole tenure because he survived, <laughs> and then just invested that. So now they're independently wealthy, and they just are fucking cool. And they like pursue their hobbies and travel the world. They went to the Netherlands at one point, or I forget if it was the Netherlands or Sweden, one of those you know Icelandic uh, paradises. And they said that like, they came back, and they're like, everyone there is like tall and blonde and fit and beautiful, and we were walking around feeling kind of like shit the whole time we were there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, oh my god, we're the ugliest people in this country. No. <laughs> this is the worst vacation. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mean to derail us too bad. I just knew I wouldn't have anything to contribute other than my funny. one anecdote. So, Because also, yeah, like, again, having come from the East Coast and, like, I remember just one of the first, like, things I experienced walking around Colorado was there was a family with their, like, multiple dogs and multiple children with, like, all the children on bikes and they were all going down, like, doing, you know, like, sort of mountain bike riding and these were all children from ages probably like four to eight where the mom was riding in the front and guiding them and the dad was running behind and the dogs were running in circles around them and they were just shouting encouragements and i was just like so that's what this state's like huh <laughs> that's what people say <laughs> if i went back to new jersey it would be like four kids eating potato chips and playing smash or whatever kids play splatoon no that's old i don't know fortnite it's probably still old i'm too old for this shit Go on. Somebody, somebody save me. Uh, you, the, before we begin, uh, they are saying that they compare a lot of things between countries, between states, between time periods, and they use BMI. And uh, they do agree. They say most experts consider measures like body fat percentage to be a better measure of adiposity than BMI, which I guess adiposity is the fancy word for fatness. 
And we agree. Unfortunately, nearly every source reports BMI and most don't report body fat percentage. So in order to compare between sources, they have to use BMI instead. And BMI is a really terrible measure of like obesity. In my- I don't yeah, know how I- it got popular. I know it was some shitty marketing or I guess successful marketing, but yeah, that, I that technically count as obese grain now. of salt. Yeah, almost everyone does, which is kind of annoying. I mean, uh, uh, BMI, I assumed, got popular because it's super fucking easy. You just divide um, height by weight, and that, that's all you got to do. You don't need yeah, any sure. special calipers or anything. I mean, a lot of things are even calipers. easier than that, but they're not popular, right? You just guess or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. You just put in your height. I, I, I know like it's, it's simple, but it's not informative. I will include a BMI calculator in the show notes. So we can all feel bad about ourselves together. Yes. As a quick note as to uh, what is considered normal, a overweight is a BMI of 25 and obese is a BMI of 30. And I myself am just barely obese by according to this BMI calculator. So Which is fuck insane. you. Now, it's important mm-hmm. to keep in mind that there's no real sense in doing this. Um, like I guess unless you feel like it, but yeah, do it for comedy yeah, any, reasons. Anyone, anyone who's met Inyash can tell you that he he doesn't fit anyone's archetype of of obese. So like, this is just a pointless metric. Um, yeah, I have a little more fat around my belly than I would prefer to shut have. Up, <laughs> yeah, first of all, shut up, and second of all, <laughs> Jesus, uh, okay. well, and second of all, so does literally everybody, right? That's um, literally the case why we are here today. Because yes, literally everybody has this problem. And all right. We're going to find out why. Okay. Part one is mysteries, where they go through a whole bunch of mysteries. The single sentence summary, I believe, is it's not just that we're a little fatter than our great-grandparents. The entire picture is different. And the uh, authors point out that a century ago, the average man in the U.S. weighed 155 pounds. Today, he weighs about 195. Back then, 1% of the population was obese. Now it is 36%. Uh, in the ni- 1890s, the average BMI was about 23. Only 3%. Uh, these are Civil War veterans that were uh, tested were obese. And most people got slightly leaner as they got older. And this is despite the fact that in the past, people's diets were worse than ours, not better. They ate more bread, uh, almost four times as much butter as we do. They had more cream, more milk, more lard. And yet our great-grandparents maintained their weight effortlessly, basically. Like I want to go back and just put time. scare quotes around mm-hmm. things like better and obese. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, <laughs> because using you know, the like, definitions that we have now. The joke about like, you know, the grandparents are like, in my day, I would eat bacon for breakfast. At, you know, like when people, uh, this is actually sad, you know, like when intergenerational families live together, I've seen this or like when somebody's in an old folks home and they have to, you know, they're being forced to stick to some like quote unquote healthy diet. And they'd be like, in my day, I'd eat like, a whole rasher of bacon and mm-hmm. all the like high fat butter. Yeah. Just, just all day long. And yeah, better, fine. better based on stereotypes that we use now based on a half century mm-hmm. of nutritional research, which is probably Nutrition highly garbage. suspect. Yes, it's exactly. Very, I, like, I, I was trying to be more charitable with highly suspect, but yeah, no, garbage. Can, can, like my, my parents um, decided, you know, they were about like no salt. I was complaining mm-hmm. to a friend of mine and uh, recently, and he said that he thinks that this was child abuse, but like my parents would buy like salt-free pretzels. My friend screamed, those aren't pretzels. <laughs> so yes, uh, compare that to the present day where middle-aged white men in the year 2000 had an average BMI of 28. About 24% were obese in early middle age, increasing to 41% by the time they were in their 60s. And this isn't just a US thing. Rates of obesity are increasing worldwide. In 1975, there was no country in the world that had an obesity rate higher than 15%. Nowadays, the rate of obesity in Italy, France, and Sweden is around 20%. And they are, you know, pretty pretty well off. Uh, the US, as said earlier, was 36%. There are a few nations that are really low, and we'll get into those later. But importantly, every country in the world is growing more obese, and the trend has never once been reversed. Yeah, obesity increased more than twice as much between 2010 and 2018 than it did between 2000 and 2008. Yep, which it gets is even worse. Orders of magnitude. Uh, interestingly, because they talk about Colorado, people who live at higher altitudes have lower rates of obesity, which and, makes yeah. sense actually if you consider the uh, low oxygen and the higher rate of metabolism that you need. But they went into that, and they don't believe that that is really that's um, a thing. 
Mm. That I mean, it's a thing, but they don't think it is a significant thing. That that is pretty minor compared to the population. Uh, I will. I'll I'll talk about that later. Uh, Let's get through this. uh, Also, interestingly, this isn't just a humans thing. Lab rats uh, get um, have lower rates of obesity when they move to high altitudes. Uh, People living at higher uh, elevation have lower rates of diabetes than those living near sea level. And this isn't happening just to humans. Lab animals who have these same diets, uh, very controlled diets, zoo animals that have controlled diets, all of them are getting fatter over the past 40 years or so. Uh, l- wild animals that live near humans are getting fatter. Because <laughs> so they're eating this, out of McDonald's garbage cans. This, this is not just a human problem. Uh, I mean, eating out of McDonald's garbage cans is part of it, but uh, we will get into more detail about uh, what the entire thing they have put out. They got, they got a very long essay on this subject. You can't just say they're eating McDonald's out of garbage cans. It yeah, feels that a, easy. It'd be a short story. essay. Certainly zoo animals aren't. So that, that, that's, yeah. that's a very interesting observation. And lab animals and aren't either. I have my own petting zoo now, and I'm having an interesting time trying to like maintain the health of my own animals through artificial means. Mm-hmm. But yeah, again, like let's get mm-hmm. through this thing and then... Like ramble. Yeah. Which uh, just keeps gaining weight, god damn it. <laughs> That's adorable. She's a uh, little chunky Lizzo. They, what about like the Congo though? Oh well they point out they also look at a whole bunch of hunter gatherer <laughs> tribes and uh any tribes that are away from industrialized civilization uh tend to stay lean no matter what they eat. Uh Including there's a almost tribe- nothing but honey. <laughs> There's a tribe in the Congo that during the rainy season, honey eats up, uh, provides up to 80% of the calories. Uh, their diet uh, throughout the rest of the year is 65% carbohydrates, 17% sugar, which is more sugar than the average American consumes. And despite this, they are lean with BMIs 22 to 23. And there were a number of those examples of lots of tribes uh, around. Look at uh, any photos of hunter gatherers. There are no obese hunter gatherers, like as far as National Geographic would tell anyway. And this, the the point they make is that this is true even when they have as access to as much food as they want around them. If they're eating yeah, like honey is literally just liquid sugar, so you yeah. can eat sugar for months at a time if you're a hunter gatherer, and it doesn't affect you the way it does if you're an industrialized civilization. And it's wild. Yep. Uh, they the this was sparked. This research, I believe, part of it was sparked by um, rats uh, that needed to be uh, fattened up for a study, and what researchers would normally do is add fat to normal rodent chow and this would work but it took a long time for uh, them to get fat on that diet uh and then one researcher uh had a rat run up to some of his fruit loops and just fucking go to town eating those fruit loops down and they started feeding them what they call cafeteria diets like highly processed american foods and the rats gained weight at incredible speeds uh and they compared rats that had a high fat, uh, regular rat chow diet versus cafeteria diets that have the same nutritional profiles, including very similar fat and calorie uh, percentages. And in both diets, the rats were allowed to eat as much as they wanted. Uh, when a rat was given a high fat diet, it ate the right amount and then stopped eating and maintained a healthy weight. But when it was given the cafeteria diet, it just kept eating and quickly became overweight. Something them was ma- something was making them eat more. And uh, this question is, what's going on? What's making everything in the around industrialized humans eat more and gain weight? Yeah. Anecdotally, uh, is- I can I can support this as well in that I can eat you know bowl of cereal and not feel full afterwards. Mm-hmm. Like I could go back for more, right? I'm thinking particularly depends on the cereal. Loops. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say like try eating kashi. Yeah, I'm just thinking like I feel the, like two the handfuls junk- of kashi will make me full. <laughs> I'm thinking like but the crappy cereal, like like the ones they advertise to children that are brightly colored and part of a balanced breakfast. If you add an orange and <laughs> a glass of milk and uh, some eggs and some toast, and <laughs> I mean technically yeah. anything can be a multivitamin. Part of a, <laughs> a, anything could be part of a balanced breakfast. It right? just doesn't contribute to the balance. It right. I mean, my shoe could be part of a balanced breakfast. Yeah, a slap to the uh, face could be part of a balanced breakfast if you are slapped while eating a balanced breakfast. <laughs> right. I suppose. All right. Um, what do we got here in part two? Part two claims that current theories of obesity are inadequate. They start out with the famous calories in, calories out, which uh, this psycho. is a pers- <laughs> or oh, that's a good way to pronounce it. Psycho, yeah, C I C O. I was thinking Kaiko, Waiko, uh, Siso, but Psycho. That's Psycho that's a great acronym because I believe it is pretty psychotic. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
I think 50 years of research has shown us that this is absolutely not how um, it works. No, so not how it works. It's simplified to be like useless or even just not even useless, just like, you know, the like trope, not even wrong. I, I do know that trope. I don't think it's not even wrong because it makes an intelligible claim. It's just wrong about it. But it's, yeah. Anyway, Inyash, yeah. elaborate, the illuminate. The uh, psycho perspective assumes that the body stores every calorie you eat as body fat and that it doesn't have any tools for using more or less energy as the need arises. It ignores for how the body accounts for the calories coming in and going out. Uh, if you, because in real life, if you don't eat enough, your body finds ways to burn fewer calories. And if you eat too much, your body doesn't store all the excess as fat. And it compensates by making you less hungry later on. Calories are involved, obviously. Like, you're not going to gain weight if you aren't eating enough calories. And you will gain weight if you eat way too many calories and force yourself to do so. But it's not a simple weight gain equals calories in minus calories out thing. Before I went on testosterone, I was living proof of this because I was one of those people everybody hates where I could eat literally, like, I could just eat ice cream all day and I would never gain weight. I had, mm-hmm. I was one of those people that had to actually actively try to eat fatty stuff or else I would like, and the whole family is like this. We become like skeletal scarecrows. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I also get to be happy about that. I, I can consume, like, I feel, I feel less healthy, so I don't, but you know, I, I could consume a thousand calories between the, you know, the, before the last hour before I go to bed and then go to sleep mm-hmm. for a year and not gain five pounds. Mm-hmm. Um, I hear just, guy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, fuck yeah. you guys. Well, on the plus side, <laughs> well, not anymore. You're, you're you're like one of those like actually adult sized men with like muscles, and you know, uh, I'm still like I, I'm still waiting for me like to like get big and strong like grow up, and I'm, that's just never going to happen. So. I thought testosterone was going to do that for me. Like I was like, yeah, maybe I'll finally look my age. I no. <laughs> Oh, I'm, Journal child. Yeah, but on the downside, I have to keep working out all the time, or it'll turn into fat. Because, but you look, but you look shredded, and, and you know, whatever. So. <laughs> all right, well, it's a okay. trade-off. <laughs> Grass is greener on both sides. Go on. Okay, uh, going on. Uh, it says that uh, currently everybody knows, in quotes, that diet and exercise are the solutions to obesity. Uh, but despite the fact that everyone knows this, uh, nothing is getting better. Uh, even with all the medical advice that we have, uh, all the diet and lifestyle interventions, and a $200 billion global industry devoted to helping people diet more and exercise more, uh, it's, it's not a working. Setting number. It's a lot of money. People are exercising more today than they were 10 years ago, uh, much more than they were 20 years ago. Contrary to stereotypes, more than 50% of Americans meet the health standards guidelines for aerobic exercise, but obesity is still on the rise. Why could this be? They have been studies about force-feeding people to make them fatter. Uh, God, this sounds like that- such a fun study to take part in. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I would feel sick. The, the, that, that was sarcasm. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, okay. Uh, and generally what they find is that it takes a huge amount of eating to get people to gain even a few pounds. And then as soon as the overfeeding stops, they go back to the weight they were before the experiment had started. And importantly, these experiments all occurred before 1980-ish. Because one of the major beats that this essay keeps hitting is that uh, obesity levels started trending up around the 70s and then like really started taking off in the 80s. Uh, so and- you could exper- importantly, just clinical researcher or ex-clinical researcher note, they mm-hmm. did a lot of studies on uh, prison inmates. Mm-hmm. You're not allowed to do those anymore. Like you can, but the amount of federal oversight that you need make it like unprofitable. You can't do research on any humans anymore, which is well, kind of ridiculous. Even volunteers. Yeah, but I mean, in particular, um, protected persons include inmates, pregnant yeah. women, children. Like, yeah. Uh, but, like, Ever. prisoners actually make really excellent study candidates because they're all in the exact same environment. You can, like, control all of their, you know, temperature, the, the food they eat, like, but uh, also because they're prisoners. You can't fairly compensate people. For, uh, anyway, okay, this isn't that. This isn't that podcast episode. It is not that podcast episode. Anyways, uh, in 1971, uh, inmates were recruited from the Vermont State Prison. Uh, some of them were eating 10,000 calories per day. They did gain considerable weight, on average 35 pounds. But following the overfeeding section of the study, they all rapidly lost the weight without any additional effort. And after 10 weeks, all of them were back to within a couple pounds of their original weight. Uh, 
it turns out that even when eating truly stupendous amounts of food, it takes more time to gain weight than it does to lose it. I'm really uh, tempted to say, wow, 10,000 calories a day. That's like two Big Macs. <laughs> I'm just kidding though. Cause I, I think that's not true. That's I think only one and a half is, is like 500. <laughs> I think a Big Mac is like 550 calories. Oh yeah. wow. Is it? Shit. Yeah. Pe- people shit on McDonald's for like, being super yeah. loaded and i i'm that number i think is within 100 calories are the right answer that's like actually like, a reasonable meal it really size. is the thing is if, like... if you get a giant if you get a giant soda that's where uh, most of yeah. the, the calories come in oh but, and they always try to shove those on you you know do you want the combo with the soda like fuck you, I, you're I, well i mean you could just say no <laughs> i don't i don't drink soda anymore, <laughs> no i do but but, but, but like i i remember I'm like, trying to about, shove it on me i learned a lot about mcdonald's uh the the uh, healthfulness of the food when Morgan Spurlock did that mockumentary oh, um, right. Super Size Me mm-hmm. yeah. back in the day. And th- it was it was a yeah. load of shit. The guy forced forced himself to eat more than he was comfortable with and he already had an underlying medical condition. And that was like, oh, look at this. McDonald's is terrible. And I, I guess I'm raving against it because fries used to taste better from McDonald's than they do now. <laughs> largely in well, part, I think, due to the bad press from this movie. So now they use vegetable oil. And mm. they're less good. And now, okay, they're, now they're making over. fucking healthier food. How dare they? <laughs> I liked the unhealthy fries. Right? Like, that was why you went to McDonald's. Why even bother anymore? I don't. And and I think the healthy <laughs> should be in quotes anyway, because they aren't controlling for lithium content. But uh, we'll get to that. Yeah, mm. I'm desperate to get to the punchline here and just to the, I guess, after, after party after punch for the line. punchline to, to see, what, <laughs> see what we can do. Yeah. So. Let's keep let's keep moving through. They say the same the story is the same for exercise. Even in ex, uh, in experimental groups, uh, the groups that exercise the most, equivalent to about twenty miles of jogging every week for eight months, only lost about seven pounds over those eight months. Uh, this is uh, the case with hunter gatherers as well. This tribe that they looked at were only slightly more active than Westerners, had more food than they know what to do with, and none of them were obese. Yeah, uh, that except... was the Kitava tribe. Oh, sorry. Yes. Um... They they'd studied them in um, Hungry Brain as well, and I thought it was really interesting because if you go back and read the Hungry Brain, they would say that, that there was this case study of the one obese Kitavan, and yeah. this was the guy that was uh, I forget if he was an accountant, a politician, like it, 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 he uh, had to go put a suit he moved on to the Western world, and go to basically. an office job, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then they became fat like everybody else around them in, in the Western society did. Once they put a McDonald's in there, I'm just yeah. kidding. Apparently, McDonald's is fine. And so the, <laughs> and so the conclusion is that people in 1950 were a lot leaner than they are are, are now, and it's not because they ate less or exercised more. Yeah, Dad. Uh, <laughs> the the there's the good calories bad calories theory, which uh, says that some calories are much worse than others, such as fat uh, calories from fat or calories from carbohydrates. Uh, the they basically knock down both of these. I, going to try to get through it's a little quicker since there's so much to get through but uh fat consumption has fallen over the past few decades while obesity has continued to skyrocket also carbohydrate consumption has gone down starting approximately the year 2000 uh people in the u.s just when the atkins diet was getting really popular that was demonizing Uh, carbs okay People in the U.S. Uh, pre then ate almost twice as much wheat, primarily in the form of bread in the 1880s than they do today. And also about 62% of the Japanese diet is carbohydrates, most of it white rice. And despite that, they have uh, the lowest of any lowest obesity rate of any industrialized nation or among the lowest of any industrialized nation. It's really low there. Uh, but interestingly, people who move from Japan to the U. Yeah. People who move from Japan to the U.S. get much heavier. So that mm-hmm. suggests it's not simply genetic. Sugar consumption also been declining for 20 years. Uh, obesity, diabetes has also continued to increase. And this does include all types of sugar, including honey, our regular uh, table sugar that you think of, and high fructose corn syrup. Um, obesity in Australia nearly tripled from 1980 to 2003 while sugar consumption dropped 23 percent and ultimately the good calories bad calories thing just doesn't really pan out because all diets work about equally well uh doesn't matter which one you choose do you lose the yeah, same what amount their of pounds philosophy is like the mediterranean diet um atkins diet like you know the all meat diet the all vegetables diet like and and they all have these specific you know gurus that will try to push their particular theory of that this has like these vitamins or the brain, yeah. you know, and the bodies, like, you know, we evolved to consume fat. And then like, when you switch from, I, I'm talking about keto here and I'm making fun of it a bit. Okay. It, it doesn't matter what the philosophy is. 
they all work just as well as long as you stick to literally any diet. <laughs> Yep. And uh, the problem is that none of them work very well. They work just as well, and they work badly. Uh, mm -hmm. In all cases, people lose about 14 pounds over six months and then begin to gain it back after 12 months. And that's and, really upsetting because exercise doesn't work either, as you were saying earlier. So, like, what do you do? And the interesting well, there's part only is one way to find out, which I'm assuming is to finish the post. I'm on the edge of my seat, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just weight loss they wanted to point out. Uh, diets, uh, the sorry, satiety, satiety, satiety. Help me out here. Thank you. Satiety, hunger, satisfaction with the diet, and adherence to the protocol is similar for all diets. Anyways, so medical science, the nutritional um, research, been kind of shit for a long time. The satiety answer is the is the feeling of not feeling hungry. Anymore. Yeah, the feeling yes. of fullness. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. So the the answer that they point two is the lipostat. The body is, um, it's an organism that tries to, well, not just the body, all living organisms try to remain in homeostasis, which means that uh, when you do something to push it out of whack, it tries to get back into whack. And this is one of the reasons that drinking <laughs> uh, pH, pH water is really stupid. Your blood pH never, ever changes more than a small percentage uh, because your body needs it to be at a very small range to function correctly. And when you try to drink other pH stuff, it's going to either leach calcium from your bones to get your blood to the right pH or do other things. And yeah, you know, you can affect your body by trying to, by drinking lots of different pH things because it's going to do stuff like that. But the point is, it's always going to keep the blood pH level in a certain narrow range. And your body has a lot of things that it tries to keep in balance like that. Yeah, this is also why any kind of detox diet is bullshit because you have kidneys and a liver. That, that, that is your are, detox. That, that's what it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You but, um, you'll know if it's not doing it. You will <laughs> die, probably. <laughs> or, <laughs> or be, be very really, sick. Really that's, sick. That's why they call it a, a liver. Yeah, because you you're alive if you have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that that is humor. a grown worthy wordplay pun, if I do say uh, so myself. It's super dark humor. I love it. So uh, As, one of the things yeah. that your body tries to keep in uh, stasis is the, um, I don't want to say just fat percentage. It is the amount of leptin in your blood. Uh, it, they make the comparison that the house has a thermostat and the human body has a lipostat. If your body is too thin, the lipostat will drive you to eat more, exercise less, sleep more, and store more of what you eat as fat. If your body is too fat, the lipostat will drive you to eat less, move and fidget more, and store less of the food you eat as fat. Uh, it the, sounds like if I can uh, tell my lipostat that my body is too fat, if I can trick it, then I'll be they've tried. more energy to fidget. Exactly. And, like, okay, th they've well, tried supplementing right. leptin or fucking around with leptin a bunch, but it's more complicated than that. They've tried mm, sewing yeah. two rats together, which if you read the original, the, the OG, as you might say, uh, thesis on this hungry brain, there's all these like horrific rat studies where, and even human studies. Uh, mm, gross. I'll, just, I'll leave that there as, um, as a little, Tempting spoiler or something for reading yeah. the hungry brain. They sew rats together. What's going to happen? Uh, find out by reading. Well, the everyone's brain. on the trailer for the human centipede, <laughs> so we all know what happened. Yeah. All right. But <laughs> yeah, you, you are correct. If you could trick your little cat into thinking that you're too fat, then you would store less as fat. You would be less hungry. You would uh, move more. All those things. And research overwhelmingly supports this. Uh, not only because sometimes you can fuck with the lepistat, such as brain damage to the implicated areas, uh, mm -hmm. will give you, uh, it will lead to overeating and eventual obesity. Uh, there, w these systems are well understood enough that by targeting certain neurons, you can cause or cure obesity in mice. And the few weight lo loss drugs approved by the FDA largely act on the brain. So th th this is a thing that's known. This one quick trick that doctors hate, the lobotomy <laughs> for weight loss. <laughs> It's almost like everything's controlled by your brain. Weird, man. Mm. Uh, the They hit this analogy a few times, and I like it, so I'm going to put it out here. Uh, if you have a house with a thermostat that's fucked up and it's set to 120 degrees, there's a lot of things you can do to lower the temperature. Like, you can open all the doors mm -hmm. and windows. You can open the fridge. You can or order mountains of dry ice. And all of these things will lower the house of the temperature. Uh, but even so, it's still going to be hotter than the healthy temperature of 72 degrees. So, and... fucking, I'm in a sixth floor. I'm at the, mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm at the top floor of my apartment. I have not had to turn my heat on. In fact, just the last few days, I've had to have my air conditioning on because mm -hmm. all of the heat rises up into my apartment. 
So everybody yeah. else is cold because in Colorado, we just had a winter storm blizzard thing. Mm-hmm. Everybody else is cranking their heat up. I have mm-hmm. my windows open. I have my air conditioning on. I, I am like sitting there in my boxer shorts with a fan on me. <laughs> anyway. I need some fucking insulation between your floors. It's, it's not a good apartment, but go on. <laughs> yes. That's but all. yes, uh, <laughs> uh, the house will still be hotter than the healthy temperature. And the furnace is going to be working double time to push the temperature back up to where it thinks it should be. Uh, and as soon as you relax any of these measures, uh, your temperature goes right back to where it was before. And that is their it analogy, sucks. basically, to opening yeah, opening doors <laughs> or uh, ordering lots of dry ice is the analogy to exercise and diet and such. And it'll lower things a bit, but not back to where it should be. And also, as soon as you stop, it'll shoot right back up to the bad set point. Anyways, the, uh, yeah, they say that the one of the most important hormones that regulates this is the hormone leptin, which is naturally produced by fat cells. Part of the action of the lipostat is making sure that leptin levels are kept within a desired range. And that's what keeps us at a desired weight. Uh, they do mention this terrible genetic mutation, which honestly... It feels like something you should filter out when when you do genetic testing on your embryos, um, because this this sounds like the most IVF. Yeah, yeah, this is a gruesome experience. Well, also just like when you're testing to see if the child you're carrying has Down syndrome, this would be another one of those ones where I'm like, oh no, flush it out and start over. Terminate that one, but also like the hungry brain suggests that you could actually create this mutation later on in life. Oh man, I'm it's it sounds horrific because it it makes it it, it's a. it's a mutation that makes it so fat cells no longer produce leptin. They are, from the first weeks of life, insatiably it. hungry. Yeah. By age two, they weigh more than 50 pounds and maybe as much as 60% fat by weight. Uh, and they're, they, the, the children become distressed if they're even out of line of sight for a food, barely. And it's they, they talk about some people who make it into their teens. And when they are like this, they're... I mean, they're constantly trying to gnaw on anything they can. These are the people that you see on those, like, you know, horrible reality TV shows. But, like, that, that's actually what it feels like from the inside. And Yeah, yeah, it feels like you're that, starving. Like, people with really terrible obesity genetically probably have a smaller feeling of this. You know, like, yeah. I, I was like, yeah, dad, earlier <laughs> sarcastically. But my, my mm-hmm. whole family is genetically you know, skeletal, like I said, and they mm-hmm. all like to pretend that this is some kind of moral superiority, no, which they just like I think is smug. disgusting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, and it's just, there's no empathy for people who no matter how much they eat are never satisfied because hunger is, and I, I felt it's hungry. fucking brutal, man. Yeah. Um, and it, it, like, imagine just it takes being... over literally everything in your brain. You can't like willpower your way through. Like I am hungry. It's, yeah, yeah. They start thinking about yeah. nothing but food. They only talk about food That's amongst all they themselves. Talk about, yeah. It's said they become obsessed with food paraphernalia. It's yep. I mean <laughs> collecting it's, different yeah. spatulas and shit. Like, yeah. And watching I, probably I, like tasty videos. <laughs> um anyways, they say it's not clear what would cause the lipostat to be set to the wrong point. In previous theories, the factors that damage the lipostat are related to diet, but as they've argued above the persistent failure to find a solution in our diets suggests that we should start looking elsewhere. Yeah, go on. I have complaints, but let's finish this. Okay. Uh, they Part three is environmental contaminants. Can, they argue that contaminants are the only cause of the obesity epidemic and the worldwide increase in obesity rates since 1980 is entirely attributable to their effects. For any two people in a group, the difference between their weights is largely genetic because everyone is exposed to similar levels of contamination. But the difference between the average weight in 1980 and the average weight today is the result of environmental contaminants. There are many causes that they use the phrase entirely attributable. That is their uh, assertion. Yeah, no, it's it's make make bold assertions. That was one of those do it initiatives, oh, yeah. right? So mm-hmm. at, at the very least, this is testable and confident. Good for them. Derek Sivers approved. I mean, if the human obesity rate has been pretty much constant across all civilizations and all historical time periods up until the very recent past, that would, I, I don't know if that's true, but uh, that is what they're asserting. And I'm assuming that can be checked out. Uh, then that would be strong evidence that something changed recently and uh, changed all over the place. Keep going, and um, I'll tell you my hypothesis. Okay. So uh, they say that there are many compounds that reliably cause people to gain weight, sometimes a lot of weight, and all of them are psychiatric medications. We, all, we know of many medical conditions and medicines that can cause obesity. 
right now, what they're looking for is uh, something that fulfills the following list of eight items. One, a change that happened over the last hundred years. Two, with a major shift around 1980. Three, whatever it is, there's more of it every year. Four, it doesn't affect people living non-industrialized lives, regardless of diet. Five, but it does affect lab animals, wild animals, and animals in zoos. Six, it has something to do with palatable human snack foods unrelated to nutritional value. Seven, it differs in its intensity by altitude for some reason. And eight, it appears to have nothing to do with our diets. Quick question. Why does it have to do with palatable human snack foods if we're talking about animals and zoos? I was going to say... Number six, I was going to put an asterisk around that because that has to do with my hypothesis, but I want to finish this and then I'll speculate wildly. The reason they say it has something to do with palatable human snack foods is because it was first discovered when the uh, rats started eating those and that cafeteria diets are very reliable in making animals overweight. And um... But it would seem like the zoo animals with controlled diets uh, that aren't eating snack food would be like would ba- basically prove the negative on that, right? Yes, that is... That is um, why they say it's an environmental contaminant, and the we'll get into later why human snack foods have even more of this contaminant than the general environment. So uh, that 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 yeah, that is why they say it has something to do with the snack foods, but obviously that cannot be the whole thing because it's in the environment everywhere, not just I, things that eat snack foods. I realized after I reread that it said has something to do with that. Maybe I was putting too much emphasis on that. So something to mm-hmm. do with it doesn't say caused by. All right, that's right. It's not caused. Did, did you want to jump in with something, Jace? No, I'm trying pretty hard to, like, shut up until the end. Okay. <laughs> All righty. It's hard because Please I'm hold be your like, objections ah! until the end. No. But I, I won't do that yet. No, All right. In the ash. If it becomes unbearable, don't hold back. They reiterate well. that people's diets were worse, in quotes, in the past, and that didn't cause obesity, and that people started <laughs> Lard rapidly... And bread and yeah. tigers. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. My grandma had a cookie recipe that had lard as a key ingredient, and they're delicious. It's funny that people are starting to, you know, on the keto diet, lard has come back into fashion. Bone broth. Mm-hmm. People are trying to eat as much fat as possible because that's what the. Uh, sorry, it, it's entertaining to me. Lard. So they say that the um, indication that people started getting a lot more obese rapidly in the 80s uh, is suggests that it's the byproduct of some industrial process. So they're looking for a compound that was invented around 60s or 70s, because that would probably, it would probably take a few years to get enough in the environment to start affecting us. Or alternatively, compounds that had been invented much earlier, but only began to see widespread development around the 80s. The obesity epidemic keeps getting worse because these contaminants continue to be produced and continue to build build up in the environment. Lab animals and wild animals, animals are becoming more obese because they're exposed to the same environmental contaminants that we are. Um, and obesity is less common at high altitudes because of the watershed. Environmental contaminants build up as water flows downhill and are in much higher concentrations as you approach sea level. And uh, to, to as a data point, they point out that the Mississippi watershed is America's largest drainage basin, covering 41% of the country. If you compare this map of state-level obesity to a map of the Mississippi watershed, you'll see that every single state with obes- obesity rates of 35% or higher borders on a river from this watershed system. Also informative is that the three states at the mouth of the river, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Louisiana, are numbers one, three, and four in the nation in terms of obesity. So they're saying altitude does not affect obesity directly. Instead, altitude is a proxy for how high an area is in the watershed. That's why Mississippi is more obese than low-lying areas in California. In California, the water supply hasn't traveled nearly as far in its path to the ocean and has traveled past fewer farms, highways, cities, and factories. Um, and the fact that diets don't work very well for most people suggests that we pick up these contaminants from other sources than just our food. They're probably in some degree to our, in our water, our workplaces and our homes. I'm finding this compelling. Uh, I'm finding this to be a compelling explanation that is, and I'm desperate to see if there, what the, if this article offers a secret sauce at the end to work around this. I'm just Fun fact, I didn't read this before the, post, before the episode. So <laughs> you said you were going to, you were going to say something, Chase? What I said was I'm skeptical, but again, I'm holding my thoughts to the end. Okay. Uh, very, you know, carefully. All right. Uh, they they point out that when immigrants come to a from a country, when immigrants from a country with lower obesity come to uh, a country with higher obesity, they become about as obese as that country is, uh, which means it's probably less genetic and more about the environment. But also, some people are affected by these contaminants less than others, which is um, which is 
obvious anywhere where you know you see a bunch of people living in the same area and they're different weights uh so even at the same dose people can have differences in their reaction to it and that probably is uh inherited from parents genetic in some way they still are on average more fat than their ancestors however so part four criteria the big inflection point for the obesity epidemic they say is around 1980 so we should be looking for com compounds that entered the environment slightly before then uh they also put forth the criteria of dose dependence, that people who are exposed to a high dose of the contaminant would be fatter than those who are exposed to a low dose. And that would be a strong indication that the contaminant is responsible. Uh, but then they say there may be some caveats. There might, for example, be diminishing di diminishing returns, where if someone gets 100 units of the contaminant, uh, they don't... Uh, nowadays, someone gets 100 units of the contaminant. In 1970, everyone got zero. Maybe the first 20 units really make you a lot fatter, but then after that, it trails off. Like, you can only get so much fatter, so the next 80 units uh, don't have as much of an impact. That would make the dose dependence look weaker. They also say the problem with contaminants is that it doesn't make you gain weight the very same day. So the correlation is drawn out a bit. And there are paradoxical reactions to most drugs uh, that we take, which means that some people, when they take a drug, will sometimes have the exact opposite reaction as is normal, as uh, we are intimately aware of in both the caffeine and modafinil world. Sometimes mm -hmm. uh, there are some people who have the opposite effect of normal people, where they so get more sleepy sleep. on those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is exactly. I mean, uh, my cat, when I was trying to move to Denver, I asked, I, I was like, talking to the vet because my cat freaks the fuck out in cars and i was like she's gonna freak the fuck out in a plane so bad we tried like benzos on her and benzos made her freak the fuck out <laughs> yeah uh, that sucks we tried gabapentin which didn't really much and unfortunately what i had to do was sort of just hold her down for the four-hour flight while she yeah. screamed and i was that person on the boat. too bad you couldn't just give her like a weed gummy which as far as i know <laughs> does chill it might work on cats too but i yeah i wouldn't know the uh whatever like sad the diminishing returns uh, wrinkle in this is interesting, and I just wanted to lament it for a second because it means that should we identify the cause, you know, with a high degree of, of confidence, we could cut back uh, hypothetically eighty percent of of the contaminant over the next decade and see no improvement. Possibly right? yeah. just just rolling out like these these kind of made up numbers, right? You uh, can try mm -hmm. to take a big sample size and do that. I suspect that it wouldn't work. This is real for reasons. Mm -hmm. They do propose experiments later. There are a couple other um, complications that they mentioned that'll make things harder. One is that it's this is a contaminant that probably isn't measured because uh, if it was, someone would have noticed by now how directly related it was to obesity. And um, it, uh, that there are a lot of chemical and biological reactions uh, that can happen in once you have environmental contaminants that are very, very hard to track because when they end up in environment, they can sit in soil or groundwater for decades and during that time transform into things, other things based on what is around them, uh, radiation from the sun, heat, that sort of stuff. Plants also, like uh, a lot of plants, you know, they tend to absorb and accumulate heavy metals, mm -hmm. uh, other contaminants as well. Mm -hmm. So this, this, this is actually really frustrating when I try to like recommend different nootropics to people that are, are like ashwagandha, um, kava, where I actually think that a lot of the like root problems or like, scaremongering articles that people find about them is because they are in areas that have terrible, yeah, chemical uh, contamination and plants will gather and hold heavy metals. Yeah. Uh, basically they anything that's going to be in water, anything that's permeable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you're just going to eat that. Yeah. This, this comes up directly, uh, in the very next part, uh, it, that, um, Things things do build up like that, uh, and also things that can like these things can get mixed up in our bodies as well, <laughs> and that is all harder to track. They give malathion as an example. It's extremely deadly to insects, but safe for mammals, including humans. Malathion, thank you. But it's only safe because the mammal's liver detoxifies it with an enzyme, rendering it harmless. If something destroys this enzyme or interferes with its action, it turns into a uh, massive poison. And that can happen with certain organic phosphates, which are used as in insecticides on uh, other produce. So, um, you know, it it's rare, but th there are things that are considered safe for human consumption, which if you get two of them at the same time in your body... Uh, very bad things can also if you take any other drugs or supplements or even certain kinds of foods they can also interact like this i hate the trend of nootropic stacks 
where people are like, this thing is good. And then if I add this thing, it's going to be double plus good. And then I'll mm-hmm. add this and it's just. They can <laughs> combine in ways that you weren't expecting. They can stack. They can cancel each other out. They can become toxic. Like, uh, uh, yeah. but again, that's a, a rant for maybe another episode. Okay. <laughs> but now well, like, what about livestock? Yes. So these are the criteria they have laid out. They have um, spelled out some challenges and now they are going to take a few guesses. And like with any good mystery novel, they have to give us two good suspects that are (laughs) not the actual suspect that uh, we're going to end the book with. So uh, I'm going to go through these two suspects pretty darn quickly because they're they're not lithium. uh, And we already know that that's the punchline. So part five is... Yeah. Part five is livestock antibiotics. Uh, the main reason, uh, first of all, um, they point out that antibiotics use can lead to weight gain because it fucks up your gut mi- microbiota. Uh, and that people who, and um, that people who eat fewer animal products have lower BMIs in general. Can I um, and- push on that real hard? Because I think this is very important. Go for it. Uh, so I had a coworker who was in her mid fifties who took a round of antibiotics for uh some basic illness, you know, and it destroyed her entire like gut microflora to the extent that she got a yeast infection in her mouth. Ooh, damn. Antibiotics. Don't take them unless you really need them. Go on. Yeah. That, that's okay. it. All right. Now. <laughs> okay. Uh, I contribute. I, I, yes. <laughs> Uh, then they say that there is evidence uh, against this as well near the bottom of this part. They say, for one thing, Germany, Spain, Italy, and Japan all use lots of antibiotics in their meat, and none of them are particularly particularly obese. Australia and South Africa are both pretty obese, and both of those use a lot less antibiotics than usual. That, that sounds like a sufficient enough counterexample to at least get rid of the livestock antibiotics causes obesity hypothesis. Uh, yeah, the main reason it's brought up here is because of the thing Jace was talking about, bioaccumulation. Where environmental contaminants are in the environment, they will build up in plants because the plants, you know, refine... They suck everything uh, up and then they keep it. Yes, exactly. Especially uh, if you eat a root vegetable, but it also, you know, it, it goes into the leaves or in the fruit. What's even worse is that uh, animals bioaccumulate even more than plants do because one animal has to eat many, many plants over its lifetime. I know this is a citation needed thing, but <laughs> you'll I have to take my is. word for that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and therefore, the concentrations in animals are significantly higher than plants, and those plants are significantly higher than groundwater, so it just keeps stacking on each other. Uh, and yeah, we this animals is a thing that we will come back to later. Like livers and kidneys and pancreas. Yeah, which plants I, don't. I don't think that and, pancreas has that pluralization, yeah. but... And you know. uh, for good reason, apparently, yeah. <laughs> Part six is our next suspect. Uh, per- Polyfluoroalkyl substances. Thank you. Which is abbreviated <laughs> PFAS, and I'm just going to call PFAS for the rest PFAS. of this for the rest of this episode. Uh, it's a group of synthetic chemicals that are used to make a wide variety of everyday products, including food packaging and nonstick cookware. Uh, and they're used in lots of industrial, aerospace, construction, automotive, and electronic applications because they are practically indestructible. They repel oil and water and are heat resistant. Uh, they have a lot of great uses, like your spatula. Like your spatula, yes. But when they uh, looked at the PFAS serum levels in the general population, what the PFAS serum level was in any individual person or area really didn't correlate with BMI at all. And so they said this doesn't look to be a direct contributing factor. Uh, The main reason I pulled this out is because while they were looking at the PFAS, uh, they looked at industries that use a lot of PFAS. Uh, and these include uh, firefighters, because it's big and firefighting foams, cookware and food packaging, paints and varnishes, cleaning products, automotive uh, applications. Superheroes, because they use it in their, uh, in their shit, suits. What was it? No, the, the immobilizing foam that was actually really OP. Oh, the Steven, you know this. containment foam from Worm. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I was going to write on that for a second, but sure. <laughs> While they were doing this research into PFAS uh, and seeing if it was linked to obesity, they decided to look into industries that use a lot of PFAS and seeing how much more obese they are than the general population. Uh, and that bring that laid out a lot of statistics from several uh, industries, which are going to come back to be used later. Uh, mm-hmm. Protective services rates, which includes police, firefighters, and emergency responders, had a obesity rate of 33%. And just to start out here the general 
population of um, working Americans has a 24.6% obesity rate. So 33% significantly higher than that. Just uh, cleaning and employed in the US. Yeah, yeah. Cleaning and building services, uh, service workers were 29.5%, so a bit more obese. Truck drivers were the most obese at 38.6%. Uh, mechanics were number five at 28.9%. Uh, also, health service workers, excluding doctors and nurses, were about 28.8%, which is also higher than the average. Uh, so but, like, these are things we'll come back later. That. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Both yeah. of us. Okay. okay. High five. All right. <laughs> so... Let's get to part seven, lithium, the thing that we have all dun, been building dun, up to. Dun. They start off this section by saying, fortunately, we don't have to spend a lot of time and effort showing that lithium makes you fat because everyone already knows lithium makes you fat. <laughs> everyone who takes lithium at therapeutic levels gains weight. This or is sub-therapeutic uh, levels. Or uh, sub-therapeutic levels uh, as well, yeah, uh, which is a thing that we get to in this post. Uh, at nor- normal therapeutic doses, 15 bipolar Inpatients gained an average of 13 pounds over six weeks, uh, was the first study they pulled out. Um, lithium, we I do remember uh, them saying that it's probably not a compound that is directly measured often because otherwise people would have seen this correlation. They say that while lithium is easy to detect, assessing lithium levels is not part of the standard analysis of drinking water. So we don't have reliable historical data to work with. There aren't even EPA standards for lithium levels in drinking water. Also, measuring serum lithium is relatively easy, the lithium in your blood. And people who are starting lithium treatments get checked frequently to make sure that their blood levels aren't too high. Despite this, there doesn't seem to be any data on serum serum lithium levels in the general population. Someone who gets their blood tested pretty regularly for uh, serum testosterone since I inject it every two weeks. mm -hmm. They don't give a shit about lithium. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They're like, nobody's looking at lithium, so uh, this, this is a thing that might have been overlooked. Uh, They point out that while lithium is a natural substance, almost none was produced before 1950. And lithium production really spikes around 1980. Uh, When I looked at their chart, I was like, "Mm, looks more like 85 to me, but uh, whatever. Quibble. Like right about when I was born. (laughs) Uh, They point out that lithium levels in drinking water vary systematically with altitude. With higher concentrations. Yep, with higher concentrations in in districts and lower altitudes. So they talk about the therapeutic dose, which everyone knows makes you fat. The therapeutic dose is usually considered 2,800 milligrams per milliliter at the minimum. Uh, the recommended low dose is twice that, 5,600 nanograms. Yeah. Uh, lithium nanograms. levels... Oh, did I say milligrams? Yeah. Sorry, I meant nanograms. Slash yeah. ML. Yeah, nanograms per milliliter. Uh, Lithium levels in groundwater rarely exceed 200 nanograms per milliliter, which is less than a tenth of uh, what the therapeutic dose is in blood. Uh, They say, however, surprisingly, even very low levels can have an influence on our health and mental states. One study examining data from 27 Texas counties between 78 and 87 found that rates of suicide and homicide, as well as other violent and impulsive behavior, were negatively correlated with lithium in drinking water over water lithium levels that ranged from 70 to 170 nanograms per milliliter. So even in that tiny um, range, it was measurable in terms of uh, suicide and homicide and violence. Uh, I was going to say, wasn't that the same decade that they took lead out of uh, petroleum that you put in your car? I think that was 10 years earlier ish but okay yeah, around the same time period so we started testing water and being like what the hell is even in here what's even yes. in here but that was around the time period that lead starts getting taken out of water and this is actually something i wanted to bring up uh later on because it wasn't in this essay and i think it's a very interesting correlation mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. but since it wasn't in this essay i wanted to save that until a little bit later we'll, we'll save all our right. shit till the end and then we'll all just scream okay for like 20 minutes and then we'll end the podcast real quick they mention other reviews of literature that uh, show that trace levels of lithium have meaningful impact on behavior. Uh, they do say that serum level in the range of 10 nanograms per milliliter is in, in your blood is enough to influence nothing. mood. Almost nothing. Yeah. You wouldn't even, and, if you put a drop of this on your pinky finger, you, you wouldn't be able to see it unless you were like using a magnifying glass and had to go on. Yes. Yes. Uh, So they're saying if trace amounts are enough to cause obesity, then we should see relationships between trace lithium levels and obesity rates. And they say we see exactly that. And then they just drop bombs full of stats. Uh, They say (laughs) in in the Caspian Sea, lithium concentrations are 280 nanograms. Some of the most obese provinces in Iran border the Caspian. 
For the most part, Austria has normal amounts of lithium in its drinking water, around 13 nanograms. But in the east, the concentrations are much higher. Uh, in the Mistelbach district, the average level uh, was 82 nanograms. The single highest measurement was near Graz at 1300 nanograms. Both of these are in eastern Australia, Austria, sorry, where obesity levels are highest. Um, Miss, Mistelbach in particular is one of the most obese districts in the county. Chile and Argentina are the most obese countries in South America, 28% each. Incidentally, the most Americanized, like modernized. Sorry, go on. Uh, but importantly, are the two are two of the biggest exporters of lithium in the world. And this is reflected in high lithium rates in their groundwater. Uh, quick interjection, just because I got confused on how big a nanogram was. I think I said a thousandth of a milligram. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a millionth of a milligram. So it's it's uh, it's one billion, right? Of a gram. Of a gram, right. Mm -hmm. I, it's just... Uh, we're talking about depressingly tiny quantities of stuff. Yeah, you like, know, getting like something that. down from thir from from two hundred billionths of a gram per milliliter to a uh, hundred billionths of a gram per milliliter. These are upsettingly like tiny there. amounts. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just want to throw that out there. Uh, in seawater, lithium concentrations are quite reliably high, ranging from 100 nanograms to over 1,000 nanograms. Uh, in fact, I recently saw a thing about a proposal of how to get more lithium from seawater because the world needs more lithium for its batteries. It was pretty neat technology. Uh, anyways, uh, yeah, seawater has high levels of lithium. The Middle East is extremely obese. One of the most obese regions on Earth. I'll barely trail the U.S., and Kuwait actually exceeds the U.S., <laughs> that's just a kind of an insulting note about how fat the u.s is but i guess we've also been industrialized the even longest. fatter than the fucking u.s <laughs> yeah, yeah right and all of these countries get a lot of their drinking water from desalinated seawater saudi it's... arabia getting half of it from desalination which is mm -hmm. one of the most obese nations on earth which i feel like is not very highly publicized kuwait built its first desalination plant in 1951 which i don't I mean, like, maybe this is a sort of point against its favor, but it seems, I don't know, like more countries should maybe be desalinating seawater, but uh, Kuwait built its first desalination plant in the 1951. It's actually been one of the most obese countries in the world for a long time. And in 75, when the rate of obesity in the U.S. was around 10%, the rate of obesity in Kuwait was about 80%. Oh. Desalination... Uh, Go on. Okay, the, the desalination removes all trace elements from seawater, but because distilled water corrodes metal pipes and trace elements are important to health, the desalinated water is remineralized by blending it with ten to uh, five to ten percent brackish water. So they put some of that seawater right back in it once it's all yeah, done. Brackish Just, water you know. is part uh, desalinated and part salinated. Yes, and this does mean that desalinated water could easily have lithium concentrations of up to a hundred nanograms. Per milliliter, yes. <laughs> All of these are per milliliter. Just, uh, I'm not saying it the whole time because it's too many syllables for my tiny little NGML. Mouth. Niggle mill. No, no, rather not that. You're towing a line there. Yeah, NGML actually goes, rolls off the tongue and, and paints the picture for sure. I, when I worked in clinical research, I had to like basically talk in acronym and the only thing that got me through my day was trying to pronounce them sometimes. So mm -hmm. just ignore me or cool. vibe with me. But they also continue on to say that lithium has a wide variety of applications, which oh, shit, we all know in a it? lot of things. <laughs> well, one of the best things you can do about it with it is make lubricants. If you go to see your local auto mechanic, the black smears covering his hands and forearms, or her hands and forearms, uh, mm -hmm. might be engine oil. Mechanics and unfortunately never had a woman work on my car at any of these places. <laughs> yeah, they're almost exclusively male. Uh, uh, might be engine women, oil. got to break into the auto, auto mechanic in industry. Sorry. You're not going to the right way, like mechanics. Sorry, just, sorry shut up. Just go on. <laughs> I, I really want to go mechanics to the scooters of the mechanics shop. Yeah. Uh, but that might be engine oil, but it might also be lithium grease. The grease is ubiquitous in auto engineering, routinely applied to hinges, joints, and pivot points. It's used in aviation, lots of heavy machinery, including uh, construction equipment, trains, tractors. Uh, it has some household applications you might put on your garage door or hinges on your gate. It's also uh, about... WD-40. Uh, is it in WD-40? So. Okay. Uh, about 7% of the global supply of lithium, 7%, goes into lubricating greases of one kind or another. And true story, in between when I read this article and when we recorded here, I went down to the basement, got my tube of lithium grease, and threw it away. 
because oh. I have lithium grease in the house because it is fucking amazing. Like, there's a reason you use lithium grease, and it's because it's really good. And uh, it I is- like how you just threw it away just to guarantee it'll show up at our water <laughs> supply. In, in the yeah, WD-40 is oh, lithium-based shit. grease, uh, and apparently it's attributes mean that it won't melt it won't freeze it won't run in harsh weather all right well i didn't i didn't think about that i'm gonna go back and dig it out of the trash because the trash has not been taken out yet <laughs> where, where are you so gonna, it's not getting our water supply you, you're gonna drive it to the coast and throw it in the ocean like i'm i'm gonna send it to elon and he's gonna put it into space <laughs> <laughs> and then everyone will be happy uh, anyways uh yeah um Lithium on the plus side doesn't have doesn't stay in the body for very long. Uh, usually about thirty six hours, uh, which is nice. Um, on the other hand, it also shows just how much there m- might be in our environment. Then, if it is a constant problem, uh, it also interestingly stays longer in certain body tissues than others. While in general it uh, lasts about thirty six hours, lithium has an increased affinity to thyroid tissue. And high concentrations of lithium are found in brain tissue, especially in the white substance. Um, this is the uh, lithium therapy is often associated with thyro- thyroid disease. Uh, and uh, more is... women, I think, uh, yeah, women have more white tissue and men tend to have more gray tissue. So okay. it probably affects women disproportionately. This is particularly bad because thyroids are one of the things that uh, regulate our weights. Uh, My mom and... had a hyperthyroidism and had to take radioactive iodine to kill her thyroids. And... Oof, Throughout the rest damn. of her life, has to take synthroid synthetic thyroid hormones, which are mood stabilizers, yeah. and keeps going online and finding herbal supplements yeah. and going off those medications. But when uh, not when, everyone, yeah, it's a lot of people. When yeah. people that were in lithium therapy uh, afterwards had their after death, of course, had their brains uh, sliced up and uh, examined, lithium concentrations were especially high in the thalamus and Broadman area twenty five. Uh, they say this is interesting for our purposes because Broadman Area 25 in- influences changes in appetite and sleep. Uh, and the thalamus governs sensory relay in visual, auditory, senso, somatosensory, and gustatory systems. So both those brain regions are related to eating. Yeah, but also just your thalamus in particular. It, it does your sensory stuff. It does your motor stuff. It regulates your consciousness and your alertness. There's a lot of stuff that goes on there. Mm-hmm. So they, they have a number of stats like that. I didn't name them all. They jump into part eight, paradoxical reactions, which we mentioned earlier, uh, that sometimes when mm-hmm. people take a drug, they have the opposite reaction to what it normally does for most people. They say if obesity is the condition, the paradoxical paradoxical condition would be anorexia. Uh, they point out that clozapine, which is a drug where most people gain 10 to 15 pounds, uh, rarely some people lose huge amounts instead, up to 50% of their body weight. Lithium increases leptin in most patients, uh, and this is presumably what causes people to gain weight, uh, but in some patients, lithium reduces leptin instead. And so they say we would maybe expect um, for the increase in uh, obesity to coincide with an increase in anorexia. And yeah. uh I forget what the title was. There was the, it might have been Slicer Codex or it might have been post, you know, Astral Codex mm-hmm. 10 era, but maybe this is what you're going to say too. There was mm-hmm. that one essay, though, that Scott wrote about certain um, diseases suddenly seeming to spike mm-hmm. at certain times, one of mm-hmm. them being I remember anorexia. That one. And yeah, it yeah. pretty much correlates. It was the 70s, 80s. Yeah. Uh, They talk about anorexia for a bit. Anorexia people have extremely low leptin. Brain lesions can cause anorexia. Uh, The lipostat does more than just regulate appetite. It can hijack broad swaths of brain function, including emotion and cognition. And that's where they mentioned those children from earlier that always act like they were in starvation. Uh, they point out that lipostat can do other things. Uh, this was also mentioned in Scott Alexander's post earlier, that when a pursu- person has consumed more calories than they need, lipostat can in- boost calorie expenditure by making them fidget. Uh, it's largely involuntary, so people don't know they're burning extra calories, but even so, the fidgeting can burn off nearly 700 calories every day. Uh, interestingly, when people eat less than they need, they become sluggish and fatigued. So they are not, um, they're burning less calories. Uh, here's the thing. People with anorexia who eat less than they need fidget like crazy. A classic symptom of anorexia is excessive physical activity. Uh, Uh, I wasn't necessarily anorexic before I went on testosterone. I fidgeted way more than I do. And probably you and Steven have observed the extent to which I fidget. I can't not be like doing kind of hand things like this. Uh, we're on video right now and nobody can see this as we're recording mm-hmm. it, but I'm always rocking back and forth. Uh, 
side to side. Yeah, um, but as with so many things, you're a unique data point. Yes. Well, of course. We're all uh, exceptional. We're all special snowflakes. This unique is all way. strong. This is all strong evidence. They say that people with anorexia have lipostats that mistakenly think they need to lose weight. That thing Stephen was saying would be great if we could do. Uh, the and the anorexia did come on relatively uh, quickly around this time period. You already mentioned the uh, Scott Alexander post about it. Sorry uh, if so I smacked you on that. I didn't realize. No, no, it's okay. I, I won't go further into that. That was that was great. Um, okay, cool. I I have a quick question. Um, go for it. So it mentioned earlier that. Uh, uh, there are some people who are resistant to lithium's effects on weight gain. Mm -hmm. uh, and I imagine that this is congenital, which would explain mm -hmm. why, like, my dad, for example, uh, he was the one who gave me that joke about consume a thousand calories, you know, in the half hour before bed and uh, go to sleep. Um, yeah. So I wonder, it seems like you could get people, I don't know, you would find the population of people that you give lithium to for uh, psychiatric illness and check some percentage of them that don't gain weight on the drug. Right? Mm -hmm. And you're saying we could, uh, we, we could predict take before, a snapshot like, of it and then CRISPR like, it into everyone. Well, there, there, there's that, that, that's once we, <laughs> or am I jumping it, but I was thinking my, my prediction would then be that these people aren't overweight already that the majority oh, right. that, they, that they tend not to be right. Well, yeah. uh, yes. That would be the prediction. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that if anyone can find that data. Evidence. Oh, great. Well, all right. That counts as uh, a prediction. Though. I'm uh, following I, the post. Yeah, right, it, it, I'm learning. Let's go. This is this is actually mentioned a little bit later, so I'll just jump to it right now. They do say that the people who gain weight on lithium in the post 1980s era generally were already overweight, uh, and when they went on, you know, higher doses of lithium, they started getting more weight. Whereas the people who uh, were already thin didn't tended not to get uh, overweight when they put on more lithium. Not a perfect. Oh, correlation, so it's already in the post. But, then I still give myself credit for predicting it. So. Right. Yeah, totally. It just shows uh, that I'm following the what, what you're laying out. So yes, picking up what right. we're putting down. That I'm he is listening successfully. <laughs> uh, they use this as um, more evidence there to their post because they say if you compare obese countries to countries with the highest rates of eating disorders, they match up pretty well. The more obese they are, also the more anorexia eating disorders they have. And the rate of change between obesity between 1990 and 2016 is correlated with the rate of change in anorexic eating disorders between 1990 and 2016. Uh, they do have one interesting callback here uh, because they still think that PFAS might be a contributing condition that helps attenuate some of this stuff. They say it's notable that anorexia most often occurs in teenagers and young adults, especially young women. Are young women being exposed to large doses all of a sudden, just as they start going through puberty? Where would these doses come from? What? Uh, it says pithos <laughs> are included in many cosmetics. Fuck. So, um, yeah, that 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 is a thing where they're like, maybe pithos has a has a um add additive effect. Anyways, part nine is anorexia in animals, which I'm going to skip over completely because uh, they basically laid out a very good case from the beginning why it's extremely hard to measure anorexia in animals. Uh, mainly, if wild animals get anorexic, they just die and we never find out about them. And if uh, animals that are domesticated or in labs yeah, get anorexic, it's usually recorded as failure to thrive when they die. And also, if an animal stops eating for any reason, including like because they have ulcers or whatever, that's uh, considered an anorectic symptom. They're basically just... They, they're, they there's no really good data. There. Yeah. But what's going on in Pima in the Middle East? Though? Okay, so there are a couple interludes uh, in this that um, they they looks like they wrote up most of this before and like started posting it one by one, uh, and then they added interludes in between as people replied in subreddits or on their website directly Which addressing some of these concerns. Yeah, yeah, it was great. They even directly uh, replied to a comment Scott Alexander had, which was cool. Uh, <laughs> I, I skipped most of the interludes for time here. They do say that they don't see much of a correlation between income and obesity, despite the uh, U.S. stereotype that rich people are thinner. Um, so that was interesting. Uh, they, it goes against the, everything that I've seen anecdotally, too, which is cool. Yeah. But they said, according to the data, there was very little correlation between income and uh, and thinness. Uh, the, the There are like some interesting exceptions that they had in there, but I won't go into them. Read the interlude if you're interested in those exceptions. Uh, the interlude that I was really interested in, there's two of them actually. One is Pima and the Middle East. Uh, Pima was something that someone emailed them about. They're like, hey, what about Pima? There, there's no there's no lithium in Pima, but there's uh, lots of really overweight people there. And what this is, is Pima is a, the Pima people of the Gila River Valley had very uh, high Gila. level. 
He, oh, I, oh, I don't know. I have yeah. made the grammar. No, you're right because it's probably a up. it's probably a Gila dragon. Yeah, I'm not sure. Probably. <laughs> yeah. It's because I'm a lizard file anyway <laughs> uh the pima people had very high levels of obesity way before the obesity epidemic started as high as 40 percent obese back in 1970 um however the uh the authors of the study were like huh that's really interesting i wonder what happened there and we're spent time looking into it and they said actually the pima people were exposed to very high levels of lithium early on because the gila river valley in the Gila River Valley, deep petroleum exploration boreholes were drilled during the early 1800s through thick layers of gypsum and salty clay found throughout the valley. Oil was not found. However, salt brines are now discharging to the land surface. They looked into if this is a big deal, and yeah, oil field brines tend to contain huge amounts of lithium. Whoops. Absolutely insane <laughs> amounts of lithium. Like, we've been talking about things in the hundreds of nanograms, maybe thousands of nanograms. This was like tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands yeah, of nanograms. It was doses in your fucking drinking. Maybe not quite Well, that. in your oil field brines. And in your yeah, oil field, they, yeah. Like, this is a lot. It, it was a bunch. Um, and they do say that, in theory, these wells should all be sealed and the brine should be injected deep <laughs> underground. Fortunately, the oil and natural gas industry doesn't make mistakes, so we can stop now. Oh, yeah. Stop looking further into sure this. Everything's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, that led them to do some further research and found that the United States, uh, probably most and people we'll already know this. talk about the most hated state in the United States. <laughs> the United States is one of the top three oil producing countries in the world. The average uh, oil well in North Dakota produces 18 barrels of brine per barrel of oil and three barrels of brine per barrel of gas. There appear to be more leaks pretty much every year. <laughs> we but nobody gives a shit because it's North Dakota. Who even lives there? Nobody. Yeah, nobody. I mean it's it's, it's just bad some lands. it's just some salty water. It's just brine. What? Who cares, right? Like lithium doesn't hurt anyone. Forty uh, percent of the brine leakage by volume came from pipeline leaks. Uh, in 2014, 42 such brine spills uh, occurred per week on average in North Dakota. Brine has even been used in commercial products sold at hardware stores <laughs> and is spread on local roads as a de-icer. It's the shit the you're washing off your car if you live the in industry one of offers, the places that gets snow as often as we do. Yep, the oil industry offers brine free of charge to rural townships that use the salty solution as a winter de-icer and in the, sometimes, in the summer times as a dust tamper on unpaved <laughs> roads. In 2016 alone, 11 million gallons of oil field brine were spread on roads in the state of Pennsylvania alone. And um, I, I just want to say, like, right now, I don't think we can blame the oil companies for this because as far as they know, it's just salty water. It's just brine. Uh, no one thinks about lithium. No one is testing for the lithium. It's not a big deal because they don't know it's a big deal. But yeah, this, this shit is everywhere. And the more oil digging a, a state is, the more it has this. Let's be solar punk, please. Ah, that would be nice. Or like radiation... Uh, not radiation. God damn it! <laughs> the thing's <that's> nuclear. <laughs> yeah, let's be nuclear powered. Let's be radiation powered. That that sounds okay. actually really like derogatory. But uh, they, vegetation. Yes, vegetation. Uh, uh, lots of vegetation is known for um, curing some heavy elements or another. Uh, different ones will filter out different things. Cabbage accumulates sulfates apparently. Mm -hmm. uh, wolfberry is really good at picking up lithium, which they know because. Uh, <laughs> they studied the plants around the Pima Gila River Valley, and, and there's a lot uh, of wolf legumes. There. Most legumes. Legumes, like, too, you say? Molybdenum, you're okay. saying? Lithium. Like, they say uh, it's... That, that, that includes, like, you know, kidney beans, black beans. Basically, like, almost everything you're going to get at Chipotle is going to have some lithium and some molybdenum. in it. <laughs> oh, damn. If this is correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they, they say the Pima people were probably getting 100 times more lithium from wolfberry jelly than from their what, drinking water directly. Uh, but they say this is actually probably a good thing because if we can find out which plants are concentrating a lot of lithium, we can start uh, avoiding those plants. Uh, and we won't have to worry as much about our drinking water or treating yeah. them differently. Yeah. I might just, uh, as far as this all sounds so <laughs> bummer that I might as well just push back on that optimistic note and point out that it seems like the Pima region or people, I forget what it, what it is. That was a region. Uh, they're already exposed to orders of magnitude more than like the United States, right? Or at least no, parts of the United States. That's a tribe, yeah. Uh, so if they're already exposed to orders of magnitude more, like, all right, great. If we cut out wolfberries, we can cut that back some. But it seems like 
one one hundredth of what they're getting is already plenty enough to like cause an obesity spike. So even if like cutting out wolfberries cuts out ninety percent of the problem, mm-hmm. it's not actually going to do anything, right? Well, maybe. Like one of the big problems they point out later on is that there just hasn't been much research done on this at all. And while lithium is their best suspect right now, like. They want to do more research to see if this is actually the case because they, right now it's a strong hypothesis rather than, you know, a, a or strong correlation thing. or strong correlation. Yeah. They also had an interlude on wells, which I found fascinating. Uh, they while they were researching this about the uh, oil wells, they started thinking more about like, well, what about just regular water irrigation wells? Because apparently, back in the day, nobody got their water from deep drilled wells. All the wells were fairly shallow, things that a human could reasonably yeah. do without they didn't the... Have the technology to do these really deep, you know, not just getting groundwater, yeah. but getting like the several substrates deep water. Yeah, they said um, that that uh, some of the water that people are tapping into now, because water levels have dropped so much, are over 100,000 years old. Um, but anyways, uh, nowadays, millions of people drink water from deep wells every day. And generally, the deeper the well, the older the water you're drinking from. And uh, when they did spot checks of a bunch of wells in uh, several states, they found that most of them, over 90%, were drilled uh, in 1970 or later. Uh, and the majority of those were drilled 1980 or later. And uh, studies by the, from, by the U.S. government showed that lithium concentrations are positively correlated with well depth. Uh, this was really interesting uh, because apparently this came out after they initially wrote uh, A Chemical Hunger, and they added this uh, after, afterwards um, in an update. On February 11th, 2021, so I guess they wrote this before February 11th, 2021, uh, the U.S. released a report titled Lithium in U.S. Groundwater. The first conclusion they share is that 45% of public supply wells and about 37% of U.S. domestic supply wells have concentration of lithium that could present a potential human health risk. Uh, The... Also, coming back to Colorado, say that while the average level of lithium in Colorado well water is higher than the national average of uh, well water, this doesn't matter because almost none of the drinking water in Colorado comes from wells. 95% plus is snowmelt, and snowmelt has no lithium in it at all uh, because it it was distilled out when it went into the clouds. Yeah, But we could uh, test areas that, like the pockets of Colorado that do drink well water. We could, personally also... um... I actually have a bunch of like water testing strips that I, it's just like sort of part of my, when I move to various areas. I, and do I they test, test for the lithium? Water. Uh, yeah, you, you can get ones to test for lithium. Oh, sweet. I mean, like, interesting. But the thing we is, you totally do should do that. Oh, wait, no, there's another part, so I can't write. Well, the oh, downside okay. of that is that, like, if we find lithium, it's like, so what? All right, it's in our water, too. I don't know. This all sounds like a bummer. Is there any good news? Only one way to find out, I guess. Oh, part well, 10, what to do about it? I think Fingers there is. crossed. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm going to say real quick, the good news is that, uh, sure, we're more fat and the, that is killing people due to higher incidence of stroke and heart disease and all that. But it all boils down to normality. Like, you, you aren't dying of lithium poisoning right now. We, we are already feeling the effects. So uh, we're, we're not like, you know, being crippled, poisoned to death at, at the moment. Although concentrations do tend to be increasing. Anyways, this part 10. article, yeah, points out that like... There are other major causes of preventable death and disability, tobacco use, mm-hmm. injuries, infectious disease. And I would even point out breathing in, you know, if you live in a city, you're going to breathe in the smog from cars, uh, mm-hmm. the, you know, ground up tires on asphalt. Mm-hmm. Like, you, you, people don't take just sort of these things into account when they're talking, you know, like, people talk about... Always try to... I've, yeah, I've always been, like, try to skiing, I've, I've been like skiing or ice climbing or done like cave like thing uh, whenever like uh, other rationalists talk to me and they're like you know how many micromarts that is and i'm just like is this one instance more than the sort of like three years of accumulated just breathing in fumes from cars yeah i'm or leaving, just driving a car of, generally the intersection of i-25 and i-70 for like a year, right mm-hmm. that I is mean, horrible yeah so it, it you're like i feel like the the danger of going to the going to the caves and and spelunking <laughs> for a weekend is probably probably on like on net better use of my weekend than sitting at home. Yeah, if you compare the apartment. amount that it's amazing and that it gives you like increased reason to be alive versus yeah. the danger, it's so much more dangerous to just drive a car. That's one of the most dangerous yeah. things you could ever do. So yeah, part ten. What to do about <laughs> it? The answer is almost nothing. 
Uh, because if you think about it, and I'm going to pull this back to the lead uh, um, example, lead was an environmental contaminant. There is almost nothing any one person could do about the lead they're exposed to. Like, sure, maybe they could paint over the walls and so their kids don't eat paint uh, chips or whatever. But, like, you can't take lead uh, out of the air. That that had to be a massive civilizational effort. Can I just say, I did have childhood hmm. friends who ate paint chips. Okay, well... I mean, uh, living in South Asia, I was a little bit behind the times, but I remember that being a joke. Like, yeah. oh, dude, 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 Jason eats paint chips or whatever. Yeah. And then, like, so, it's um, like, no, it tastes like candy. Try the paint chip. Lead tastes like sugar. Uh, it's still used in candy in like Mexico. Yeah, there's, there's very little uh, anyone can do uh, individually. And they point out that there are no populations in which obesity epidemic has been reversed by public health measures. In every country in the data set, the obesity rate has either stayed the same or increased every single year from 1975 to 2016. There's not one example of obesity rates declining for even a single country in a single year. In the U.S., between 2001 and 2011, obesity rates decreased in zero counties, stayed the same in zero counties, and increased in 3,143 out of 3,143 counties. Uh, there were, if you zoom in much smaller, in uh, smaller time sections, you could find a few small decreases, but uh, overall not much. But there are a few things you can maybe do. First is you could just put on more muscle mass, apparently, because the lipostat pays at least some attention to how much you literally weigh. So if you gain more muscle mass, you may lose fat mass, even though you'll stay the same weight overall. Uh, they also say that eating more whole foods and avoiding highly processed foods is a good idea because food products tend to pick up more contaminants with every step of transportation, packaging, processing, and all those. So the more processed something is, the more likely it is to have been contaminated along the way. And they do point out that potatoes are basically completely unprocessed. And a lot of people, or, or there's at least two striking examples in the recent past where someone was on a potato diet for reasons and uh, accidentally lost tons of weight and like had trouble eating enough to stay at a healthy weight just because the 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 potatoes don't really have any of the processing, any of the uh, lithium in it. There, there's a, a few foods like that. Nuts also very, um, very unprocessed. The, the less processed something is, the better. Couldn't that partially be explained by the fact that like, I only have potatoes to eat, so I'm really hungry and I don't have enough food? Like, uh, you, he, he, you were able to eat as many potatoes as you wanted. It wasn't a limitation on the food. I guess I'm just also thinking like that sounds like nutritional deprivation. Um, but it, the, the other reason I'm... My, my, the other thing that flagged my radar there was I, especially from what Jay said, was that like root vegetables, uh, hold on to the, um, uh, the stuff that they, that they pulled in to grow, right? Yes. So I would think that, that potatoes would, I guess maybe they, maybe potatoes filter them out in the same way that wolfberries filter, filter lithium in. Uh, well, there, there's a thing about that, uh, which we'll get to in a moment. But the, the main thing to remember is that they said what you can do is almost nothing. These right. are, other steps you can maybe take that might help a little bit, uh, according to what we found, but um, they're probably not going to help a ton. Um, but that being said, I am trying to up my whole potato intake now because I don't know. I, I just read this and I was like, and it's probably nothing, but whatever. I, I, I tend to jump on bandwagons sometimes and try things out. Well, it's um, hard not to hear about like, here's this thing that's fucking you over and not try to give into your impulse to do something. Yeah, well, you know, it's it's messing with your lipostat, which is not necessarily fucking you over. But yeah, I'm, I, I'd rather not be um, having that little extra fat that I dislike. So that is a thing you can possibly do. Well, uh, for me, I'm wondering, like, you know, what... It, it, maybe they touch on this later in the post, too. But, like, uh, they use lithium to balance out people. Jason, know more about this. Um, this That's what they use for, uh, like, bipolar disorder and, like, intense depression and stuff, right? Bipolar disorder, specifically, is what it's most, most used for. Yeah. So I guess what I'm thinking is, like we're getting noticeable amounts of lithium in our bodies and like depression rates are going way up over the last few decades. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be everyone's depressed because no one can be happy because they're on, you know, fucking lithium. all day. You know, I was just thinking like th there has been the secular decrease in criminality that uh, people have been mystified by for the past several decades. I remember uh, Freakonomics made the suggestion that it could be because uh, abortion was legalized and widely available starting in the mid 60s with Roe v. Wade, which uh, possibly would have reduced how many neglected children are introduced into the population. Uh, that was their hypothesis. Uh, 
a little after that, the lead hypothesis was extremely popular and basically taken as uh, the fact of the matter that the fact that we got rid of lead, which stunts your brain and makes you more aggressive, uh, is what caused all this crime to, to stop being such a big deal. Uh, I think lately that correlation has been put a little more into question. So it's not necessarily a knockout argument like was originally presented, but uh, maybe if also lithium levels have been increasing and people are less, um, you know, less on edge um, because of what's in the drinking water, maybe that combined with um, the, the, reduction of lead and also i'm kind of worrying like you know if, if we get rid of the lithium is crime gonna go back up that would kind of suck but on the other hand so does heart disease and being fat so i don't know i feel like the lead thing yeah i feel like removing lead from the environment or reducing lead in the environment couldn't have hurt you know yeah. whether or not the correlation was was overblown it feels like well it probably didn't hurt yeah did we just lose jace yeah it looks like we may just have lost jace uh if we get jace back that would be great but uh, if that does not work out, then we will finish up without and hopefully get uh, get Chase's contrary opinion on this situation when he gets back. Yeah, um, just yes. for the for the positive spin. I <laughs> know, for, right? For, at least, at least, not necessarily even a positive spin, but maybe there's a silver lining in a in an alternative hypothesis. Um, maybe why all this is is bullshit. Well, they make a compelling case, but yeah, you know, like you said, sort of the lead people, and maybe that was overblown. So. So regarding the other things you can possibly do, uh, let's see, we covered, oh yeah, not eating highly processed foods. And that is why I think things like avoiding fast food McDonald's is such a good idea because not only is the food already highly processed, it is processed even further at the point of sale. So it's just bad mojo. Uh, they, I mean, most food is processed at point of sale unless you're ordering raw sushi, right? Uh, well, I think that... Um, Ordering ground, or getting ground beef of your own from the supermarket and frying it up is likely to be less dangerous than getting the ground beef that has been delivered to McDonald's. Fun I, fact, I haven't, I don't really eat beef, so okay, at least I'm good there. Like, I, I don't know what cleaning solvents they use on their frying, not pans, but frying flat areas there, and and also everyone I've ever interacted with that has um used to eat fast food and stopped eating fast food has lost weight, even if they eat the same amount of calories. So I think that's part of it checks out in my own personal life experience, right? Long story short, it seems like, or I guess at the, at the, the takeaway is that it seems like it's, you know, lithium's a, a positive correlate, but we're not sure more testing is needed, right? Yeah. Uh, the other things you could possibly do, eat fewer animal products because many contaminants bioaccumulate and that might include lithium. Uh, if you have a job, they say, in a high obesity profession like truck driver or mechanic, consider switching to a low obesity profession, especially if it uses lithium grease. Uh, and finally, change where you live. In, color in the USA, Colorado has the lowest obesity rate by far. Uh, it's really interesting. Uh, the lowest obesity rate is state is Colorado. We're at 20%. Uh, 50 years ago, the highest obesity state in the country had an obesity rate of 18%. Hmm. So even the thinnest state right now is fatter than the uh, fattest state 50 years ago. Uh, in addition to Colorado, Hawaii and Massachusetts are also good. What Did they say why truckers are in the high obesity range, I figure it would be a sedentary lifestyle and like eating fast food, not necessarily like working with lithium grease, like a mechanic. I would assume it's a combination of all those. Uh, they, Fair I enough. mean, it's not like you have time to cook or access to cooking stuff. So you eat a lot of highly processed fast food, right? Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And then they, I assume they also work with, Hey Charlie, when you were a trucker for those months, did you ever have to do any of your own vehicle maintenance where you used grease? Uh huh. Okay. Uh, she said, no, not really. But uh, sometimes when manipulating the kingpin, which is the big thing that holds the trailer to the, to the uh, semi tractor, uh, the, the, you know, the big joint thing, yeah. she says there's grease all over that thing. It's funny. I knew the apparatus that you're talking about. Okay. And I'm familiar with that kind of lubricant, like that auto lubricant stuff for different parts of uh, like brake parts and all that stuff as well. Um, when he called it the kingpin, I'm like, oh, I know what that thing is on a semi truck. And now kingpin's name makes a lot of sense. It's very important, which is probably, See, you know, it was clear from the name, but. I always assumed his name was a reference to the first pin in bowling because that's also called the kingpin, right? That's true. You knock him down, the rest go down. I don't know what he, I mean, kingpin, whatever it is. It important. works either way. Yeah. And yeah, he hits exactly. like a truck. So. Yes. You know. <laughs> yep uh, one they did not mention but which i was uh considering was like maybe water filters because uh i believe reverse osmosis filters work uh the same way as desalinization plants they will get rid of all minerals in the water 
and uh, that might work too. But uh, again, if it's not just the drinking water, if it's also like, I don't know, water from the shower or uh, lithium in our foods uh, and our greases, then there's many other vectors for the lithium to get to us too. Yeah. And I, I feel like there is something to be concerned with. It's like, again, with the, the Pima population versus like the United States or whatever, like if they're sitting at a thousand times the rate that we're sitting at and they're, you know, only about as obese as we are, um, mm-hmm. it seems like you could cut it out, you cut it, cut it out of your water, cut it out of, you know, most of your food, but it's still there, right? Like it's mm-hmm. just, you're, you're only cutting out 90%, but all you need is 0.01%. Uh, I don't know. It It's not clear where the critical threshold is. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe every single part that we can reduce does make a difference. Uh, because there isn't like huge, well, I guess there's still lithium exposure in Colorado, but I don't, I don't know how big the difference is between like Colorado and Mississippi or Colorado and East Texas. Can't be, it, maybe you can get East Texas levels down to Colorado levels, you know? Yeah. Who knows? But yeah, the things that they recommend actually things that we can do is doing targeted experiments to find out if this is really a lithium thing, because that would be kind of step one. Uh, they they would like to figure out which water filters remove lithium from drinking water. And like I said, I believe reverse osmosis ones will do that. Uh, they would like to do testing to figure out uh, if there are high levels of lithium in any of the stuff that we're eating because our food is not regularly tested for lithium. Uh, so breaking down what people often eat and how much lithium is in each thing could give valuable insights. Uh, they think it'd be cool to have a uh, targeted experiment with de- desalinization where we have one water plant that uses lithium-free brine while an- another continues with normal procedures, or maybe even just like have one country in the Middle East switch all their plants to lithium-free and see if that makes a difference over, you know, the course of a decade or so. Uh, they also say that lithium, which is the prime suspect they have, is an alkali metal ion that affects the brain, but lots of alkali metal ions uh, may also play an important role in the blunt brain. Uh, one of the reasons lithium works uh, the way it does for for people with bipolar is because it takes the place of an ion that they are missing a lot of. Um, there are alkaline metal ions like sodium and potassium that may compete with lithium or interact in some interesting ways. And they have a bunch of links. So uh, if lithium causes obesity, it may do so by messing with sodium or potassium signaling. Uh, so changing amounts of those ions you consume or their ratios might help stop it maybe, which might be another thing potatoes are doing because they have a lot of potassium. So yeah, question. alkali metal ions are the are the electrochemical basis of neurotransmission, right? Like people talk about the brain, like it runs on electricity. Mm, it runs on, but, on electrochemistry. You yeah. get positively charged ions at the action potentials. And uh, I guess, man, you know, there's another, I just, it just occurred to me. Okay, good. I can go to bed happy tonight. There's another mm. just obvious solution to this whole thing. Mm-hmm. If we didn't have meat suits that were vulnerable to basically fucking everything, yeah. and instead had cool robot bodies, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we'd still need lithium probably, you know, for batteries. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> right. then it would be something we want, not something we want to stay away from. Yes, we'd be always okay. trying to get more. We'll hold up for the uh, robot body there, and yeah, this there's one they don't mention at all, which I think we should mention, which is that uh, maybe we can just hack the lipostat directly, in which case. You know, maybe we'll want more lithium in our brains in order to make us less violent or whatever, because uh, there are some drugs the FDA approves, which uh, can affect weight, which looks like it messes with the lipostat. Uh, Jace mentioned the CRISPR thing where you could maybe CRISPR genes into your body that uh, make you immune to lithium like some of those people had. Did Jace mention that or did you mention that? Oh, that was Jace's idea was to CRISPR it into people. Yeah, yeah, that was Jace's idea. The idea that people might have congenital... uh... Insensitivity to um, yeah, so there there might even be a way just to directly mess with the lipostat, and you don't have to worry about lithium or lithium levels at all, uh, which might be a good thing if those are far too difficult. Like it's really fucking hard to get an entire industrial society to get lithium contamination down to zero. It sounds like it's just. Yeah in a lot of stuff but if we could do something that's like oh now your stat is set at the correct level because you take these uh these pills every day uh then you don't have to worry about the ion the lithium thing and it's 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 a thing anyone individually can do uh rather than having to abandon lithium as a thing that we use 
which maybe, I don't know, maybe that's not the best solution because again, then that puts mo- another stack of things in your body and on your liver that can interact with other things. But uh, very well could be a stopgap solution until we figure out the transhuman future. Well, fingers crossed. Indeed. I'm ready to call it a night, but not before we give a shout out to our uh, favorite patron for this fortnight. Can, can I stop oh. you real quick before we do that? Yeah. Thank you for bearing with me. This was a very long night. I did a lot of talking. It was a very long post. Uh, I'm glad I got it out there. Uh, I am personally worried about it, and I'm going to try to limit my lithium. But again, it's just a hypothesis right now. Uh, if you want to help these people with the research, you can become a patron on Patreon. They have a link. I will also include it. Or you can contact them directly if you have ideas or uh, ways to uh, do any of these experiments. That's pretty cool. Thank you for interrupting me. And thank you for listening to all my horse shit for the past two and a half hours. No, I really enjoyed it. I mean, you know, the ones where you and Jace drive, I enjoy. It's sort of like the best of both worlds. I like listening to podcasts. And this is where like, I get to be like, well, hold on. What about this? And like, mm-hmm. actually get to interject. So mm-hmm. um, no, it, it worked great. Um, I'm, I'm sorry we lost Jace for the last little bit because I was really, really wanting to hear what the... Uh, the pushback why this is all bullshit was and we will get that at some point either next episode or if we manage to to record again before this one goes out we can add it in as an addendum afterwards that's what i was going to suggest but i don't want to get people's hopes up now we got to give a special shout out to shackle shackle i'm maybe both of those are horribly off the mark but that looks like how it's spelled anyway you are this Fortnite's hero um yes hope your lithium concentration is exactly where you want it to be and <laughs> I can't think of another way to make this funny. So uh, uh, we we like the level of shackle that we have in our podcast. It is the right amount of contamination. It's exactly perfect. Cool. All right. Uh, well, thank you everybody for joining us, and we will return in two weeks. Bye.